Hey there, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer. We expect you to take these opinions, form your own financial conclusions, and make your own financial decisions. Today is Wednesday, July 26, 2023, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. In this week's episode, I'm joined by fellow Blockhead Trader Viper XL 007, and we are going to take a look at the one thing that we could boil down and say, hey, if there's one thing we would pass on to a new trader as a nugget of advice, what would that one thing be? And it's a little misleading because you're actually going to get two things. You're going to get Vipers and you're going to get mine. And one of them will be relentless pursuit of understanding and the other one will be to hold fast and commit to the long term. But before we hop to that, I'm going to give a shout out to our Discord, a link in the description below. You can click that, say hello to myself, Viper, some of the other Blockhead traders. Love to hear what you're trading. Love to type of hear what type of content you want to hear about. Also, you can go to thetagang.com forward slash sprocket888 where I post each and every one of my trades, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Lastly, you can pick this up wherever you get your podcast. And if you can't find it there, let us know and we will get it there. But let's hop to this week's content, Viper. Uh, and Viper, before we dispel the one thing advice that we want to pass on to kind of young people looking to invest in the financial markets, I don't want to say trading because I think both of these these nuggets of information really can cover the whole gamut of, of financial market involvement. So I won't say the one thing to know for trading, although it certainly is applicable to trading, um, it really can be extrapolated to uh, any aspect of the financial markets. But you were not around last week, and so I wanted just to take a look here uh, because today was the day that two of the three picks that I put out for earnings went out. And I just wanted to pull up uh, where they sit right now. So uh, if you remember last week, we, well, I called out three earnings trades that I was looking at playing. Uh, of the three, the two that I was most interested were actually today after the bell. And that was Meta and uh, Chipotle. So tomorrow is Roku, and it's not really shaping up to be that attractive. Um, I know in that when I recorded last week, I was kind of hopeful that the volatility might increase a little bit. It really hasn't. Um, I'll take a look at it anyway, um, but I was really on the fence on it when I uh, called it out last week. So I may or may not take it, but I did want to hop over here to the chains, uh, the parameters, just to see. Uh, where they fit on the profit and loss curve. And I'll take it Chipotle first because actually Chipotle was the one that I liked the most of uh, of them. And this is what the graph really ended up looking like after earnings. And so uh, the earnings move has already happened. Um, probably should pull up the chart too to, to show you that. But this um, yellow line right here that is below this leg, uh, this is where the price actually is after hours. So it had about a 200 point drop uh, after the earnings announcement. So we went from around uh, uh, 2080, 20 something like that down to about 1880 uh, was where we fell to. And this is one of the reasons that I put protection legs on the Chipotle because uh, with the underlying price in the 2K range, the amount of buying power needed uh, to hold something down here is, is very high, way too high for my uh, portfolio size. And so I was targeting that uh, 2K buying power thing. So that's why we went with uh, two contracts that are $10 wide. Um, and you can see we need a pretty big push up uh, tomorrow. These all expire on Friday, uh, but I'm basically falling outside of these wings. So this is not looking good for a winner. Uh, and with these iron condors like this, there's it's unlikely to be able to salvage much out of this. Um, I will probably look in the morning just to see if there's any ability to roll this call side leg down um, just to squeeze any sort of premium out. Uh, the problem with that and why that doesn't work so well is because that volatility, which is what you get when you sell, um, is going to contract a ton uh, likely tomorrow. And so you're just really going to have to slide these strikes down. So you can see this gray area where it stops. That's a one standard deviation move up. So that's going to be around your 16 to 20 delta 
um, and with only two days to go to expiration, uh, this is really going to kind of be pennies. And so this is truly a coin flip when you deal with a week of expiration. So this one's not looking so good. The other one I'll just give you a quick update on. This one looks a little bit better. So we jump over here. This is Meta. Uh, so Meta basically was around 300 uh, at close before they announced earnings. Uh, they spiked up to 325 uh, after earnings, and they've kind of bled off a little bit after reaching their peak. Um, so they're now sitting at around 319. Uh, my upper strike is around 330. So there will probably be some significant buying power pressure on this. Uh, just based on where this is, because this is a, there is no protection legs on this. Um, so the buying power will really expand. Uh, what I do have on my side uh, is this um, volatility contraction will be massive tomorrow. Um, and so this purple line should jump up quite a bit on open and I should be able to close both of these legs out, uh, assuming there's not a lot of pre-market activity that pushes this price up through the strike. Uh, but again, this gray area is your standard deviation move. Um, we moved less than one standard deviation on the earnings announcement. So uh, this one is looking quite a bit better. Anyway, quick update there on, on the earnings trade. If you're really interested in following it, I have both of those posted up there on thetagang.com forward slash sprocket888. Uh, so stay tuned in there. Check it out. You can find out where it actually ended up being uh, by the time this video gets posted. Uh, if I roll it, you'll see that I close one and then open a new one, but I really don't see myself rolling. I see myself grabbing whatever green I can uh, and probably booking the loss on the Chipotle on that. But Viper, let's get to the main topic this week. And I'll bring this back up because the, the two things that I th wanted to cover here is really just what is the one thing uh, if I was to impart some piece of advice, knowledge, nugget of information uh, to a young and aspiring person that wants to get into the financial, crypto, any kind of market whatsoever, um, what would we tell them? And I think this would be interesting because I think we we make a lot of assumptions um, as we record these episodes and as we uh, go further along in our journey and our understanding and our learning. Um, sometimes we kind of forget about where we started and, and what, if we were to look back, what is it that we learned uh, along the way that might be a helpful thing uh, as, a, as a word of encouragement or cautionary tale or something like that to the the younger and upcoming, not necessarily younger by age, but, you know, the new to the financial markets uh, thing. Uh, and I tried to boil them down uh, into just a sentence, and then we'll kind of elaborate on each of them. Uh, mine was the first one there, and I, I called it relentless pursuit of understanding. So let me hop into mine, and, and let's explain a little bit about this, what I call relentless pursuit of understanding. Uh, and I, I try to sum this up because... Um, it really takes, in my opinion, a lot of dedication to figuring out what it is that you want to trade, that you want to do in the markets, and, and how to do it. And I don't mean that from a complexity standpoint. Um, I, you know, no, nothing that I've come across really in the market, uh, in the financial aspects of things, is, is complex from the from the aspect of, oh my gosh, I just don't understand it. It's going to take me forever to understand this, or this is really like algebra, um, well, not even algebra, calculus or, or differential equations or something like that. Uh, it, it's nothing like that where I say it takes a lot of time and dedication. Um, the reason is because you need to gain a lot of seat time because the markets are extremely fluid there's a lot of various characteristics to them. And so it's not always, oh, it's not like gravity, right? With gravity, you're like, hey, if I drop this, it's going to fall. It's going to accelerate at, you know, 33 uh, meters per second, 33 feet per second. Um, and and, and it's, it's black and white, no matter if it's windy, rainy, all that stuff, right? Gravity is going gonna, is gonna to operate at the same, uh, the same thing. With markets, nothing is ever really the same. Um, there's always changing conditions. There's always, oh, but then there's this and then there's that and this changes and it's a lot more psychological. Um, and so it takes a lot of exposure to that and it takes a lot of observation and it takes a lot of um, focus, let's call it, to not jump to conclusions so quickly. 
uh, because if you see, you know, some sort of cause and effect, it, it would likely be incorrect to assume that that cause and effect is is always the thing that's going to come um, every time that that particular cause is present, then you don't always get the same effect. The way that I've kind of dealt with that is coming to grips or, or coming to the understanding that I don't understand anything really ever. And I question almost everything. And I do my best to surround myself with information about the topic that I want to learn about. And what I mean by that is, you know, a, a tangible example is I got into the market and I wanted to learn about options trading. And so I asked myself, what the heck is an option? Started there. And I started uh, surrounding myself with information on options. And I started understanding, okay, well, there's the, there's a call, there's a put, there's a premium, there's these Greeks, there's these deltas. Uh, and then I said, okay, well, let me focus in on, you know, one aspect. What the heck is a delta? And I would then go gather multiple perspectives of information on option, Greek, delta, um, and just kind of read it all, kind of soak it all in and go down another path of a different term. All the while, I kind of look for examples out there of, did somebody write a book explaining about this? Did somebody write a book saying why this is awesome? Did somebody write an article saying why you should never do this? Um, and whatever aspect it was that I was looking for trading. So, I, you know, premium selling is one of the things that I started down. And so I, I drove and drove and drove to as much content that I could find about selling option premium. And I started getting very excited about all of these positive articles that I was reading about selling option premium. And I was like, well, it can't all be roses. I mean, there has to be a negative. And so I intentionally kind of look for the, the con of, of what I was looking for, the reverse, the, the opposite. And then I tried to read a lot of that information and understand it. And I try to look for examples. And it's really important to not get focused on things that start aligning to what you find attractive in whatever it is you're looking at. Um, because you'll often be blinded by the flip side of that. And so that's really where this relentless pursuit of understanding is, is it's this constant, don't ever get comfortable where you are. Always ask yourself, is there something more? What is that something more? And, and just keep digging and scratching. And, and when you find something, ask yourself, but why, but why? Um, and, and just kind of keep, keep plucking away at that. And I, I think it can be very discouraging to people, um, new people to the markets and things like that, because I think there is this, this mentality that um, I wasn't trained in this. I don't have experience in this. All the experts are better than me. Um, and I view that as a rather toxic kind of attitude to have. Um, and the reason is because I really think anybody can learn these things. There's no, there's no special pedigree of type of person uh, to learn this, except for, are you dedicated? Are you, can you be relentless? And can you focus? Um, th these are all characteristics that each and every one of us really possess. And when I look at these, you know, experts that are out there, I, I really don't view them as, oh my gosh, they, they have all this schooling. They have all this stuff. They're just... I only look at them, I said, There's, they have more seat time than me. They have been exposed. They have more experience than me. And I think experience alone is not, you know, the end all be all. Um, I was reading this article um, not that long ago about experience versus expertise. And it really hit home because they said, you can do the same thing again and again and again to gain lots and lots of experience, but that doesn't make you really good at that thing. Um, it can make you good at that thing, but the difference if it's somebody that is becoming good at that thing is there's a feedback loop. There's some constant questioning. Did I do that best? What can I improve? How can I do this differently? And it's that feedback loop to yourself of your experience during your experience um, that helps you build expertise. 
And, uh, you know, I think the article I was reading talked about, you know, hey, you know, somebody that hangs around and, and, and plays in the dirt all day uh, with rocks and stuff like that doesn't, doesn't make them a geologist. Um, but, but somebody that constantly is looking into, you know, the soil and the rocks and the contents and then seeking out what is this? Why is this here? How is this going on? Um, that builds expertise. So simply being present, doing something, um, is not really the way to become that expert, but rather a feedback loop, um, mentoring, checking yourself, uh, finding something to plug in, um, you know, kind of coming up with measurables. What could I do differently? Retrospections, what, what went well, what went bad, um, really makes the difference there. So that, that was quite a bit, a lot of, I don't know, yammering on there. Uh, but Viper, uh, how does that sit for you? Uh, I completely agree. A um, <clears throat> couple things I would add is uh, really hammering the point of not getting comfortable. Um, theoret we'll call it in theory, like you should be comfortable. You know, you should, you shouldn't fear everything you do or, you know, just be on edge and, you know, this nervous twitchy Nelly or anything like that. So you should be comfortable, but don't be comfortable. And so what I mean by that is, um, this, this constant mentality of there's more I should learn or know about this. Um, <clears throat> you're going to, you know, if we chart your expertise, you know, you're going to have a, a very upward scale, um, if you're doing everything thoughtfully and everything, you know, well-intentioned and everything like, like Sprocket's saying, you will have an upward scale. Um, and undoubtedly there will be a point where you kind of plateau, um, you know, purely on your understanding, you know, and that's a good plateau because it's going to be coming after a big, long upswing. Um, but that plateau I think is the most dangerous place because, you don't have to constantly be up and to the right on your growth and your expertise. You can appreciate those plateaus of your understanding or your expertise. As long as when you're on those plateaus, you still have the mentality of, I should be learning more. I should be questioning this or that. Uh, because the more you live in that spirit, the more risk mitigation you have. And what I mean by that is a lot of people, might do everything, you know, by the books or as thoughtfully as, as we're talking about and their, you know, their experience is growing and then they hit that plateau and then there's just this subtle shift of, you know, Hey, you know what? This is working. I know what I'm doing. I know, you know, I know how to make money. I'm getting profits, you know, uh, you know, I'm taking a couple hits, but it's not bad. And there's that mentality shift where it's like, you know what? I'm going to dial it up a notch. And then you start stepping outside of, of guidelines that we talk about as far as, uh, position sizing or things like that. It, you know, it, it's a very, it can be, it can be very, it can be very obvious or it could be very subtle where you're like, you know what? I am so confident on what's about to happen here. Boom. I crank it to 11 and guess what? You get bit. Um, and so I think that's kind of a, a you know, something that came to mind as you were talking about that is, is, you know, it's okay to, to feel like I've got this all figured out and I'm, and I'm plateaued here as long as that doesn't lead back down the mountain of going, so I can't do any wrong. And you stick to the hard and rule, the hard and fast rules that we talk about a lot when it comes to position sizing and all that kind of stuff, because, Hey, you want to make a bigger bet on that thing, increase the portfolio. So that bigger bet is still the same, uh, p uh, position size to the entire whole. And that's, that's kind of the point. I promise you all the experts or anything like that aren't getting comfortable and going, you know what, time to just you know, throw all those rules away and let's double down on this play right here. Cause I'm confident in it. Um, so I feel like that's a big, that's a big thing to me of playing that mentality game and acknowledging what is at risk. I mean, I guess that's part of the pursuit of understanding is also understand the psyche and the mentality and the pitfalls that when, when wins start coming, uh, it's really going to change your mindset. And on the flip side too, when losses start coming, you could be susceptible to that. I'm no good at this. I don't know what I'm doing. And to, to both situations, I would say the position sizing is the great equalizer um, to make sure you can continue to have your skin and your education in the game. Yeah, definitely. 
And the, the, the last piece that I, I want to also kind of emphasize is that relentless pursuit of understanding is anybody can do it. It, it really doesn't take oh, you have to have a master's degree in finance or you have to have studied economics and have a PhD in it. Like all of that stuff is knowledge. All of that stuff is, is it can be helpful, but none of that stuff, in my opinion, is a prerequisite for success. Um, if anything, some of that stuff might be a deterrent uh, to success because you'll get too caught up in the theoretical or too caught up in the academia uh, approach of things and you'll miss that practical application or, or what happens in the real world. Uh, and I, I think finance is so young as far as studies go, markets go. I mean, you think of how many years of, of human existence have been on earth. And of those many years, how many of them have had a public equities market? Yes, there has always been buying and selling of goods and services in some sort of marketplace for many, 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 many years. But if you think about public traded equities markets or even more recently, crypto stuff, right? The, the, the relative length of time that that's been around versus everything else is, is so tiny that you're not really late to the game. There's there's nothing that you can't really learn along the way with determination uh, and exposure and that open-mindedness of, of being a sponge uh, for that information. And I, I think there's a lot of people out there and, and sources out there that really kind of dissuade you from pursuing that. Uh, and that's why I think it has to be this relentless pursuit because you have to go against the common messaging of, oh, you're just put your money in a bank. Oh no, you pay somebody to do that for you. Oh, that's too much. Um, you, you have to ignore that stuff uh, so that you yourself can pursue your understanding and those things, which I think is very, very important. Yeah, I agree. And I would, I would say if, if anybody's, you know, really struggling with that perspective of feeling outclassed by uh, the degrees in the, the academia and stuff like that. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify purely the academic part of it. You know, the, but that's not a part that, you know, makes money. That's just an interesting study. Um, but I'm, I, my point is I don't want to, you know, belittle or, or, you know, oversimplify that portion of it. But I would say if you're really struggling with that mentality of like, ah, you know, just outclassed by all these degrees and things like that, when it comes to being a participant in the market and being a successful and uh, well-educated participant in the market, all that degree in, in just that, just that confine, just that context, all that degree is getting those people is, is all as I view it as curated access to the experienced professionals, which you can find on your own. It's just not, you know, handed to you in a classroom in a book or something like that. It's the same they're learning the same way you can uh, to Sprocket's point as far as being an open sponge, being open-minded and listening to those experienced. Um, I mean, it doesn't even have to be professionals. I don't consider, I don't consider us professionals and I don't consider us super experienced, but we're more experienced than, you know, somebody starting today for the very first time. And that's something that hopefully um, we can, provide some of that feedback, uh, certainly not financial decisions, but, um, just kind of provide, <laughs> you know, what we're doing here as far as speaking to our experience. So, um, I don't know how many people get stuck on that, but if you do, I, I, I kind of liked framing it like that of they, the main difference is that curated access to what experience, um, they have access to. Yep. That's definitely a good parallel. So if we kind of look on beyond that one thing, because it's kind of a twofer, buy one, get one, you know, we can kind of move over to, to your one thing and I'll let you kind of dive into it. I, you, you actually didn't divulge this one thing to me yet, so I really don't know what it's <laughs> going to be, but uh, I summed it up as hold fast and commit to the long term. Yep. And it, it plays very much into your uh, relentless understanding. I mean, that's that's certainly a uh, a subtle piece of of the commit to the long term. 
Uh, committing to the long term because you need to do that understanding, that deep study. Um, and, you know, even if you have like, you know, this this vision of a 10 percent portfolio uh, risk, you know, to this certain thing, I would even still, um, you know, commit to the long term so you can scale up to that 10 percent, um, you know, as you are learning and as you're experiencing and as you're, um, you know, going through hardships, you know, because that I think a big part of the commit to the long term is what I've learned in the time we've done this show, which was on the tail end of a bull market into uh, this, you know, big, long bear market that uh, has been the majority of the show now, I think, um, is <laughs> I like I am not I am. I, I don't know that I would, I would have known this in theory back on the bull side. Um, but I wouldn't know it as real as I know it now, um, that you don't know anything until you've experienced full cycles. Um, I would be dramatically at a loss if when everything started to crash, if I was like, you know what, uh, it's over, this was supposed to be fun and numbers go down and I don't know what I'm doing and I'll just wait. Like I would be so far behind right now. Um, and to be clear, I am not ahead on profits. Um, but <laughs> you know, I would be so far behind on my understanding because, um, you know, for every step down, well, you know, then the thought process was, well, why did that happen? And I'm kind of, you know, tying to that understanding bit too. Like, why did that, why are we still going down? Why are, you know, and like, not just in the theoretical, like memeable, like, Oh, it's a good, you know, but like functionally what is happening. And that, you know, leads to all the different things, the connections, the rate hikes and all like, just, just in and on and on and on. And then being, toes in both waters of being in crypto and in equities and just seeing the connections between those two worlds of, you know, tide comes in, tide goes out and seeing how the money flows from one stage to the next, to the next. And now as we go into bear, it pulls back and then back and then back. Um, <clears throat> like that's something I could have read about and I would have been like, oh, that's interesting. And, and, you know, in my, in my most honest of notes, I would have been, I would have still made a light footnote of it of like, well, that's something somebody else experienced. And, but the fact that I committed to the long term, uh, you know, and, and, and touching these things and feeling these things as they happened, uh, for better or worse, I think has, has certainly made a, a huge difference on the impact it'll make going forward. Um, that story, that chapter has yet to be written. Stay tuned, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I certainly do view high value on the fact that I'm still here and this is not from a, we're all going to make it just stick out. Like, no, it's just, I'm still here because of position sizing solely because of position sizing. Um, and you know, even though I'm down on losses or whatever, that position sizing and, and risk mitigation and all that kind of stuff has allowed me to at least take one of the stressors off the table. It's still stressful, still definitely not fun on some days, um, but I can at least focus more on the understanding bit of it and knowing that I'm here for the long term and knowing that this is exactly what I realized I needed to experience was a turn in markets. And now hopefully as we potentially turn back to uh, to an upside up to a bull market and getting that that full circle loop, um, you know, I at least now, you know, maybe it's the hopium, but I feel very confident in being able to use this knowledge going forward. I'm already starting to use it on certain plays or things that I'm doing um, that is just a direct representation or ability because I decided to commit to the long term and up front in the peak of a bull market where everything was like, buy everything, buy everything, dump it all, send it. You know, I was able to mitigate that risk. I was able to pull back. Um, and I feel more confident now on certain plays that I make. <clears throat> I feel more comfortable when things are moving against me because I understand why they're moving against me. I understand where I entered the play. I understand what has to happen to get it into the green or to hit the bailout button and just move on. And those are things I was not comfortable with uh, in the bull market where things would move 
ten dollars against me, you know, ten dollars of pro of loss against me, and I was like, I don't know what to do. This is terrible. Uh, like so, that's experience, and also just that time horizon, and you know, you know, it, it's not saying commit to some lifelong, uh, you know, endeavor. Um, you know, you can commit to a longer time frame with whatever you can afford on a low end, like whatever you can afford, cut it in half or, you know, but certainly don't just observe really, you know, mitigate the position sizing and, and actually touch the mechanics, uh, carefully, uh, because I feel like that, that played into it as well for me. Yeah. I, I go back, uh, the thing that jumps out in, in my brain is, um, it's kind of like driving a car. Uh, in order to drive a car, it, it takes tons and tons of seat time in that car to experience all the different types of driving conditions as well as driving situations that, that you'll come across. And depending on what happens to you, right, as a young driver, um, maybe you witness a, a really, really horrific car accident. Maybe you're in a terrible car accident, right? And that can really shape or shock you. And I, I think that's kind of what, what brings to my head is it's don't give up because there's one bad experience here or two bad experiences or you get think this is ridiculous because kind of pushing through that and, and keeping in the game long enough to gain that seat time and that exposure to these different environments um, makes you more comfortable, but it also gives you the opportunity to to earn back some of those losses, right? I think it was, man, probably almost two years ago uh, that I went through the big famous soy disaster that I documented a while ago where I just was like just hammered um, on that particular trade massively. And to my point of, of pursuit of understanding and learning that that experience, I, I looked back on that and I did a feedback loop to gain expertise. And I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I, I then refined my approach and went back at it. And continually going after that, it was drip by drip, um, earning back that loss uh, to the point where, you know, looking back was like, oh, yeah, that really sucked. Ha, ha, that was pretty funny. Remember, remember Viper when I lost like 8K in a day? <laughs> um, yeah, that that's hilarious. Um, but <laughs> that's... That's kind of what I, what I, I guess hits me is if I'd have just given up there, there's so much I wouldn't have learned and there's so much that I wouldn't have have continued forward on um, to, to, to build wealth uh, myself. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I guess to make people feel better, um, you know, if they're just getting in or, or about to make their big mistake, um, it's going to happen. Count on it that it's going to happen. Um, you know, I mean, you had your soy thing. I had my SESN thing and, and like that whole thing, like, uh, I think I was more okay with it than I, sh than I normally would have been. And that was because I happened to have a bunch of winnings under my belt. Um, so, you know, it just kind of brought my account back to break even. And that was so early on in my trading that I was like, you know what? And my mentality uh, when I started was, uh, I started with X amount of money. Uh, I'm doing this myself instead of doing an ETF or something like that. So let's just make sure I don't, you know, come out after a whole year, you know, having lost more money than I would have on the things I could have done with the money. So, I mean, there was a little bit of that mentality of like, I took this big loss, uh, but it just kind of brought me back to break even, um, and that softened the blow. Um, but there were still so many mistakes in the play itself. I was way overextended on it. It was that whole plateau of like, bam, 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 win, 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 win. You know, I, I got this thing. This isn't that hard. It's the mentality of a bull market. So if anybody's watching this, you know, a year from now, if we're deep into a bull, you know, watch yourself. Um, but you get the win, 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 win. <laughs> and you're like, you know what? This is going to blow off. This is, I, you know, this is a pharmaceutical stock. Um, red flag number one, no FDA approval. Red flag number two, but went into it with that confidence of like, this is going to happen. You know why? Because I want it to happen. And, you know, overextended myself and kaplunk. Um, so, but I wouldn't have had that lesson if I wasn't in it. 
though I should have, you know, maybe more responsibly been in it. But nonetheless, the point is the mistakes are going to happen a hundred percent. Um, I, I can't say what I would have done if that was like, took me from break even to down whatever percent, uh, that would have been a much harder consideration. Um, but I'd like to think I would have pushed through and learned what I needed to learn from it. Um, but regardless in the situation that it was, I still took a step back and was like, I can see exactly how this happened. Um, let's start to get a little more serious and, uh, try to, try to not do that. So in an attempt to bring it all together in real time, like, you know, something that I'm dealing with day to day right now that kind of, I think really connects both sides of this, of understanding and long-term, uh, thinking and time in the market and things like that. It's obviously no secret or surprise based on our past episodes that I'm pretty deep into crypto these days. And it's, it's, it's very much a part of that understanding piece of this is such an interesting collision of, uh, some financial impact as well as just underlying technology, um, you know, code and systems and just reinventing, the, in, it, I, mean, I don't know, I don't want to make it sound too big, but like reinventing the financial system with all new technology and how that applies. And so the point is there's no shortage of understanding available if you get deeper and past the headlines of like Dogecoin is doing this or that, like, you know, past all of that into a deeper level, um, that it's just this endless well of, uh, understanding an interesting study, uh, to my, in my opinion. Um, but then that time in the market, it's also, um, you know, currently making me a little bit more of, uh, an investor. We obviously talk a lot about trading, um, but it's kind of opening up a few, uh, plays that are much, much more, if not entirely more of the investment side of things where, you know, based on that understanding, based on things that I've learned, um, particularly to, you know, of interest to me and feeling like, you know, it's, it's on this long-term time horizon that, um, this could be really interesting if I place a long-term bet here, here, or here. Um, and, and, you know, just having that uh, understanding of like, yeah, it's probably going to be rough a little bit, uh, in the short term here, but it also is so volatile, and there's so much potential of way more volatility on the horizon that I'm not going to try to trade these things. I just want to continue to learn and understand the basics and the, the, the foundational pieces. And then let's place a couple of long-term things and they'll, they could drop 50, 60, 80, 90%. Um, but the play is for that long-term time horizon. Um, and that is not just based on headlines I read. It's based on studying this stuff and digging deeper into it. Not saying that's for everybody because this is a little more technical when you start to dig into what's a good play here, at least the plays that I'm talking about. But nonetheless, it's very much, um, I think, a blending of these two ideas where I'm putting in this effort to go through this understanding and learn this new world, um, learn this technology, and then also being committed to understanding the volatility of it and having a, a much longer time frame uh, for it. So that's certainly what's keeping me busy these days and why I haven't talked about a lot of equities plays um, because there's, there's a lot I'm trying to just put the pieces in place and, you know, let's see what happens because I I'm on that, that longer time exposure 